Uh, thanks for the ability. Got it. <laughs> so yeah, thank, thanks a lot for the invitation um, to speak. Um, I'm very happy to be back as always. Thank you all for letting me come back uh, after a few years away. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about some work that's appeared on the archive in the past year in collaboration with Kevin Costello. And we have various uh, works in progress with other collaborators that are much more in the initial stages and I probably won't uh, say too much about those today. Um, so the goal for the talk is to explain kind of a new way um, we have for thinking about some very familiar and uh, well-loved uh, tree-level QCD amplitudes uh, with perhaps some hopes for uh, pushing things a bit farther and going beyond. Um, but our route to obtaining these formulas was a bit circuitous and you know, we didn't start thinking about these things with, with that in mind. So let me kind of tell you the story what we actually did um, and why we were thinking about the strange systems that we were thinking about. And then towards the end, uh, we'll come to uh, an application to scattering amplitudes and gluons. Um, so the story that I'm gonna be telling you about today, sorry, I guess we're, we're, all, we're gonna cut off um, the slides partially, but I can try to move things around if we need to. Um, the story that I'm gonna be telling you about today kind of involves a confluence of progress in a few different subfields. Um, I am an expert in at most one of these subfields, uh, but nonetheless, I think there's a lot of interesting connections and we were motivated to start um, thinking about the system that we were thinking about um, because of touch points in a few different areas. Um, so I'm not going to give, attempt to give any kind of exhausted introduction into these subfields. I merely want to point out that they all kind of intersect with each other and use a lot of familiar objects. And part of our motivation for this work was trying to, uh, was in identifying a few common formal structures, um, mostly related to universal physics, physics governed by symmetries, and try to make sense of why these structures kept appearing in these different places over and over again, and try to tie the observations together in a cohesive story. Um, so in particular, just to kind of highlight a few of the points of contact before I get into what, what we actually did. Um, of course, as uh, I think everyone knows, there's been a huge amount of progress um, on uh, work broadly construed using the bootstrap philosophy, um, including but not limited to the conformal bootstrap. And in particular, the, the structure there that I really want to highlight um, is uh, this expression. It's one of, of course, many, many bootstrap results, but it's kind of the one that's going to be most relevant for me today. Um, and that's simply the existence um, of a chiral algebra. So roughly speaking, a chiral algebra is like half of a conformal field theory. It loosely, it's the holomorphic half. That's, kind of, that's a little bit of a lie. Um, but we're, we imagine that um, the operator product of two operators, say in a two-dimensional conformal field theory um, that ostensibly would depend on both Z and Z bar, has kind of this holomorphic half where the operator product only depends uh, holomorphically or rather meromorphically in the holomorphic coordinate Z. Um, so for example, just the left moving Verasoro algebra is an example of this kind of thing. Um, and uh, these chiral algebras are kind of ubiquitous in the story I'm going to be telling you about today for any well-behaved, well-defined two-dimensional conformal field theory it does have a chiral algebra that serves to govern uh, its symmetries. Uh, but a chiral algebra is also just a well-defined mathematical structure um, in and of itself. It need not be a part of a consistent two-dimensional conformal field theory. And famously, some examples also live on the boundaries of three-dimensional systems. They're not well-behaved two-dimensional systems by themselves, but they can appear on the boundaries of three-dimensional systems. So the WZW model living on the boundary of the Simons theory is also an example of this kind of structure. And that's actually the more useful analog I want to have in mind. Um, and so there are many places in which chiral algebras appear. Any 2D conformal field theory is, of course, an example. But also just to uh, briefly mention work by Beam and Rustellian collaborators, they also appear in four-dimensional supersymmetric gauge theories as certain protected or VPS sub, uh, subsectors, very roughly speaking. Um, and you can obtain these effectively two-dimensional systems from the higher dimensional supersymmetric uh, systems by means of a formalism called twisting. Um, and I'm not going to really talk about twisting in this talk. It's going to be kind of playing in the background of everything I'm going to say. Um, but again, this is a motivational slide. and We should start having this as a point of contact in mind, that somehow chiral algebras arising from twisted systems are going to show up over and over again and kind of play a role um, in what I'm going to tell you about. 
Um, there's also been a recent surge of interest in reorganizing the observables in four dimensional asymptotically flat space times um, and making an isomorphism between the S matrix and um, objects that are often called or referred to as celestial amplitudes, which are like, um, which, or which at least transform like uh, two dimensional conformal correlators, again, for a, a putative two dimensional conformal field theory. Um, again, I won't say too much about honest you know, flat space holography or kind of the, the strong forms of that of those proposals in this talk, but I do want to say that there has been a recent um, surge of progress in identifying asymptotic symmetry algebras for various theories in flat space times, especially um, massless theories. Uh, and, and those asymptotic symmetry algebras often can be reorganized in terms of chiral algebras as well. And again, this will also play a role in my talk. And we were motivated to think about some of these connections because we started to recognize some of the same algebraic structures that we love. They over and over again seem to be appearing also as symmetries of a little bit more physically relevant systems than the ones that I maybe necessarily normally play with. Um, and this observation, of course, kind of the, the basic uh, reason or um, kind of the, the, the initial uh, perhaps motivation for trying to reorganize the S matrix scattering amplitudes in this way, um, in addition to hoping that perhaps you can make manifest symmetries that weren't obvious in the momentum space basis, is that the Lorentz group in four dimensions uh, is isomorphic to the global conformal group in two dimensions. Um, so perhaps if you reorganize things in terms of correlation functions supported on the celestial sphere at asymptotic null infinity, um, you might start to see wrapped toward a putative conformal field theory there. But again, I'm not going to say anything about strong forms of that proposal. I just want you to keep in mind that there are large asymptotic symmetry algebras at play in asymptotic null infinity, um, and they can be reorganized into chiral algebras, which I'll say a little bit more about later. Um, and then finally, kind of the last point of the last field where there's been recent progress and kind of confluence in, in these various ideas is actually the subject um, that I'm coming from and how I entered uh, thinking about some of these things, which is um, a subject that we've been calling twisted holography, uh, which uh, is, is essentially just a deep dive into very old fashioned things, namely, uh, ADS, I don't need to motivate why ADS CFT is interesting to this audience. Our best known examples of ADS CFT come from top down and supersymmetric uh, string models. And when you have top-down supersymmetric string models, you can apply, again, uh, things called twists, very analogous to the kind of twist I mentioned uh, in the bootstrap context, to these systems to try and, again, isolate kind of solvable or BPS or simpler subsectors of the full duality uh, uh, towards, for example, mathematically defining the observables, fleshing out the dictionary, thinking of new ways to compute the observables, um, and so on. So my collaborators and I have been interested in studying kind of these toy versions of ads cft dual pairs, which can be embedded in full supersymmetric string constructions. Um, and that's a longer story that I'm not going to tell you about today, but all I kind of wanted to highlight from the progress that we had been making on this side is that um, morally speaking, the kind of dual pairs that we have been studying look very much like um, kind of familiar, well-known open and closed dualities in what are called topological strings. Uh, the name topological string is kind of, uh, I don't want it to be misleading in this context. Um, so the 2D world sheet theories are topological in those strings, often called, they're, they're called A and B models. Um, but the space-time physics is not topological. There is some dependence on the metric degrees of freedom. And these are kind of simple toy models of ads -CFT, So I don't want just a fully topological theory, particularly on the bulk side, but rather the degrees of freedom for the metric that these toy models maintain are what are called the complex structure deformations of the metric. So roughly speaking, we can think of metric deformations as like some shape and some size deformations and the quote unquote topological string kind of forgets about uh, this, the size degrees of freedom, but still remembers these shape degrees of freedom. So it's sensitive to complex structure deformations of the metric, not all of the components of the metric, but some of them. So it serves as kind of a useful simplifying toy model. And the result is that we have these kind of holomorphic theories 
on both the open and closed sides of the twisted duality. Uh, on the world volume of the B brains, there's what's called holomorphic churn Simons theory, which depends on a partial gauge connection in turns of zero one forms. On the closed string side, there's something that's called Kadira Spencer or BCOB theory of gravity, which kind of famously is the closed string field theory of the B model. But again, it's like it's um, a simple uh, puti uh, a simple uh, baby theory of gravity that knows only about complex structure deformations. So the detail, none of the details of any of these things on the slide are important. I just kind of wanted to tell you where I was coming from. Um, what I want to emphasize is that in all of the arenas from the previous slide, we see hints of the same things over and over again. I think maybe we can make this a bit smaller even so that okay. the slides are. Oh, maybe if we do the little, uh, little minus yeah, sign. I can't see the cursor though. <laughs> oh no, spoiler alert. Uh, I don't see we, the cursor. Oh, the cursor is not visible. So let me see. Yeah. So while you're doing that, let me ask you a question. Okay. Um, if, if I care more about knowing what, what the cutter classified is, you're rather six brain on the clock up people. Is that what I should have usually? I mean, it, it depends on the particular system that we're working with. Um, but we have some, for example, um, I wrote a paper in ADS3 where we had D1, a twisted D1 and D5 systems. We have to do all of the twist 3 process 3 process 8. Um, you, can all, you can do um, a twisted version of equals 4, and there you have the B, B twisted version of D3 brains sourcing that reaction. So what you are can, the three brains on? They're on the last phase or they're on the for, for the ADS5. Right. Um, but yeah, the, the twisted version of the Ramon Ramon flux becomes a complex structure deformation. You can solve for that complex structure deformation and obtain. Um, a complex manifold uh, on which the Kadar um, Spencer theory lives. Um, okay, yeah, so, so all I wanted to emphasize from my babbling about the previous slide was just that in all of these kinds of different areas where things are moving forward and lots of interesting results are happening, we see hints of the few things over and over again, uh, the sorts of things that I, as a kind of mathematically minded person, really like. We see chiral algebras over and over again which govern asymptotic symmetries in flat space times, as we've recently been, been learning, uh, which govern protected sectors of SUSY CFTs. Um, for example, also on the world, uh, the world volume of deep brains and twisted holography, um, and, and, and as I said, in twisted string theory context. And we also see, you know, kind of concomitantly in these very simple systems, holomorphy, which again is not really news to anyone, but for example, they can govern the protected OPEs in these simple models, world volume of B brains, could I respond to theory and so on. Um, so, okay, we have some simple structures. Um, they're telling us largely about things that are in some sense symmetry protected or universal. Um, so, you know, perhaps these twin models are not really gonna capture all the physics of interest, but what I'd like to do in this talk is just kind of explain how this confluence of ideas can actually be pieced together um, and used to uh, learn something new about um, an interesting four dimensional system and ultimately to a new way to think about perhaps some QCD amplitudes. Um, so as I said, at least if you're an optimist, you might hope that you wanna tie all of these structures together, at least at the level of symmetry governed or universal or soft or informal physics, et cetera, in some kind of uh, clarifying and fruitful way. So that's what I'm gonna to try to do today. I'm gonna to try to give you a bird's eye view of what we thought about, how these things play together and the results that we obtain by studying a particularly simple system. Um, so the setting for today's talk is going to be a holomorphic theory that lives on twister space. So twister space is a six dimensional space. And as a six dimensional space, you might naturally expect that it serves as some kind of bridge between four dimensional physics and two dimensional. Of course, like the raison d'etre of twister space is to be a useful way to organize some four dimensional physics. And that's a pretty old story. Um, but the new story is that there's actually some uh, two dimensional physics that will arise naturally from it that has the structure of a chiral algebra. Um, and it turns out that these things are, are intimately related to one another. Um, so from this perspective, the main result of this talk, which I'm gonna motivate and develop uh, through the rest of the hour, is that correlators of a certain two-dimensional chiral algebra um, are uh, isomorphic to or equivalent to uh, form factors in four dimensions of a particular theory. So form factor being scattering amplitudes in the presence of an insertion of some local operator. Um, and ultimately, some of the form factors that we compute turn out to reproduce 
some 40 QCD amplitudes. And there is a reason for that. Um, and I hope that this, again, will be kind of a useful connection to yet another field of physics um, that I hope will be fruitful and clarifying in the future. But that's that's where we're going to be going. Um, so I want to tell you about uh, the six dimensional theory on twister space that I'm going to be playing with. It's a nice local theory and it's holomorphic, very much in the way that the world volume theory of the brains is a holomorphic kind of theory. Um, although for any local, so holomorphic local theories on twister space are actually quite special. Um, as I'll tell you, most, the vast majority of them are, are gauge anomalous. So it's a very special subclass of theories. But for any such theory, um, there's going to be a correspondence of this type. Uh, for most theories, you will not have a correspondence of this type. It's very special. Um, which you should, uh, but, and these are kind of special structures, so you might expect that. Okay, so I want to tell you about the six dimensional theory. First, I should maybe say a couple of words about twister space. Obviously, it has a long and storied history, and computing things in twister space and using it for amplitudes calculations, for example, um, is a whole field in and of itself. Uh, and again, I'm not really an expert in that. So I'm just going to kind of very, very roughly tell you how I think about it and set up a little bit of the important notation that I'll use in the rest of the talk. Um, and then I just kind of want to go on and get into the physics of the particular system I'm working with. So apologies to the experts in the audience uh, for how I'm about to like butcher this very beautiful uh, old subject in mathematical physics. Um, but morally, I kind of think of twister space um, first by way of a, of a useful analogy in two dimensions rather than in four dimensions. For most of the talk, I'm going to be in four dimensions. For all of the rest of the talk, I'm going to be in four dimensions. But, but nevertheless, let's start here in a slightly more useful context, uh, at least for, for building intuition, it's a bit more useful. Um, so suppose we wanted to find solutions to this very simple wave equation in two complex variables, z and z tilde. So z and z tilde um, are each live in C, the complex plane. And you can think of C2 as complexified two-dimensional Minkowski space, if you like, with an eye towards eventually moving towards physical things. Mm -hmm. Um, and you might know that any kind of complex analytic solution of this equation can be written in a pretty simple form. It's a sum of a function just of z plus uh, a, fu a function only of z tilde. Um, okay, so you have some nice kind of complex analytic solution to a massless field equation in some complex space. You might want to then specialize, take various uh, real slices of complexified Minkowski space, or C2, um, to actually uh, relate these kinds of solutions to solutions of other equations which are more physically relevant and you might be more interested in. For example, if I specialize Z tilde to be the complex conjugate of the original variable Z, then um, this solution gives me for free a solution to the Laplace equation of the Euclidean signature. Whereas I could also in, instead take the two variables to be independent real variables instead and obtain a solution to the 2D wave equation of Minkowski space. Um, and furthermore, you can also study how um, these specializations work when you fix initial data for your differential equation on some subspace of your complexified space. And for example, you can kind of naturally reproduce when you start taking these real slices, uh, the ordinary notion of the domain of dependence in Minkowski signature or um, uh, a region to which you can analytically extend the solution in Euclidean signature. The details, again, are not important. I just want you to think about this as kind of the heuristic motivation for why you would want to introduce the twister space. You want to move to a, um, an analytically continued space time where you have a nice gadget that's kind of signature agnostic. At the end of the day, you can always specialize to the space time signature in which you want to work, but there's some useful generating gadget upstairs where you can have kind of nice geometric objects or simple solutions that will then produce for you uh, solutions to massless nonlinear field equations that you might actually want to be studying for other purposes. Um, okay, so four dimensions isn't quite as simple as all that. And that's why four dimensional twister space looks extremely forbidding, at least it does to me still. Um, but basically, twister space is the analog of this gadget in a four dimensional. So kind of everything uh, that I said on the previous slide really doesn't care about the full details of the metric. Rather, it only depends on conformal classes of metric. And that might make sense since naturally I'm working with things like massless field equations. 
So this is a massless, this is a story about massless, massless physics and things that only depend on conformal structure. Um, and in two dimensions, that's really simple because um, up to a choice uh, of orientation, um, which I'll kind of ignore, once you have a conformal structure, that gives rise to a unique complex structure in two dimensions. So the correspondence that I outlined on the previous slide is particularly simple. Um, but in four dimensions, uh, a conformal structure doesn't pick out a unique complex structure for you, and so the story naturally becomes more complicated. In particular, say if I'm in Euclidean um, four-dimensional space-time, to every point on Euclidean space-time, there's naturally kind of a whole two spheres worth of complex structure. There's a whole family of complex structures um, that you can have. Um, and a, a two-sphere is equivalent to CP1, so I'm mostly going to talk about CP1, but just thinking that um, I just have a two-sphere in mind. So what twister space really is, at least as a real manifold, you should think about it as your four-dimensional space, R4, cross CP1. So you have your four-dimensional space-time, and for every point in space, you have a two-sphere that's sort of parameterizing the possible complex structures you can have. Again, I'm not really going to lean heavily on the details of this correspondence. It's kind of old stuff, but just to roughly orient you as to why I might possibly want to work in the setting. Could you explain again what the different complex structures are? Um, what, like, what is that diagram that the light I didn't talk about the diagram yet. I'll, I'll get to oh, it in just a second. Oh, sorry. So, I'm just saying that for every point in space time, we have an extra sphere in twister space. I, That's really all we need. <laughs> Yeah, it's so the sphere is a way of geometrically parameterizing the allowable complex structures that you have for a given conformal structure. How would you do that? Um, if you so we can explicitly kind of write down the correspondence afterwards if you want. Okay, that's yeah. Okay. It, yeah, there, there's an explicit map between you can kind of write down the complex structure as a matrix that you know that squares times one and, and um, extract a sphere's worth of allowable such such structures. And then there's not a smoothness condition to get something that pays together well on R4 or uh, a smoothness condition? You, you know, like you can just pick an arbitrary point on a P1 differently at each point in R4. Uh, you, you might, you might have, I don't know why. But like, every, everything that I'm saying, um, assume that I have some um, a cell phone space time where the uh, wild tensor is, is uh, equal to its star. There, you have to you have to worry about inverability if you want to think about things that are more complicated than like R four or flat to space, but I'm not gonna, not gonna go there. But yeah, yeah. integrability of the complex structure um, is guaranteed for flat space, space okay. and that's all I care about today. But still, we can pass to any signature two two one three. Is it different size or different? So you were Choices between slides. Yep. So like the Krauss choice. Yep. Yep. That doesn't mean that different No, those are real slices. So that's um, that's a different thing. So for twister space, which is really um, a story, if you like, about complexified space time or C four, we can still take various real slices at the end of the day. But I'm actually going to be working in just the analytically continued space time where I'm going to be agnostic about the signature that I specialize to. I'm going to work with complex analytic functions. Is the real slice not defined by saying the like this? Um, you, yeah, well, you do have to define real slices by relating them, um, but by defining a certain conjugation condition, but that's within twister space. That's kind of a distinct, a distinct choice. Oh. This, I, I promise this slide is not going to be extremely important for the rest of the talk. All, yeah, all I really want you to kind of have in mind is that twister space is a six dimensional space as a real manifold. It's four dimensions times CP1. Um, more properly, it's a non, it's a manifold that's defined by a non trivial vibration. Um, and that matters for details, but I'm going to probably suppress all of those details. And if you want to kind of get into details, we can talk about that later. Um, so all I want to say about twister space is that there is, again, kind of a simple gadget um, from which you can obtain solutions to classical nonlinear masses field equations. It turns out, again, to be more complicated than the nice equation we had on the previous slide. 
What you need to do instead is build special kinds of, uh, of differential forms on six dimensions. But then once you do that, you can integrate them over the CP1 and it will obtain, uh, you, you will obtain solutions um, to your masks field equations in four dimensions. And this is called the Penrose transform. So this is a classical subject. Um, but the basic idea is that I have a very straightforward way of immediately generating holomorphic massless fields on my analytically continued space time. Um, and the only other thing I want to say about the geometry of twister space on this slide, which will be kind of the, the main thing that will be important in what's to come, is that um, if I have two points in my four dimensional space time, x and x prime, um, and let's say they're null separated, uh, then two CP1s, so I'm drawing them as lines, they're complex lines in twister space, the two associated CP1s or two spheres associated to those points will intersect in six dimensions. And this is an if and only if condition. So if I have two points that are null separated, so mod x minus x prime squared is zero, say in my analytically continued space time, again, I don't have to specialize to a given signature. If I have these two null separated points, um, then and only then will the corresponding spheres intersect one another. So in Euclidean signature, the spheres will never intersect. But in Lorentzian signature, where I can actually have two points that are separated from one another along a light cone, then the spheres intersect each other. Why is that important? If I'm studying a six dimensional theory on this twister space, and I wanna ask about correlation functions in this kind of local hallmark theory on my twister space, then the correlation functions will have the property that they're going to develop poles only when the corresponding points are null separated. Um, in other words, I'll never have, an, um, I will only have singular terms in my OPE if this condition is satisfied. The result being that correlation functions in the six dimensional twister theory have a very, very tightly constrained and very special analytic structure. We know exactly, the, the punchline is that we know everything about the poles. If the corresponding 4D points are not separated, then we will have a corresponding pole in the six dimensional OPE because they're, they're actually like things are meeting each other, the spheres are intersecting, otherwise not. Um, so if you don't get anything else from this slide, all I want to say is that these six dimensional theories, again, have an extremely constrained analytic structure in their correlation functions. And that's because the geometry is, is, is highly special. What page did this fall? This age? Yeah. Uh, the helicity of the massless particle. And this is just an instruction. So take a, take a, um, a differential form, a zero one form. Um, it'll be valued in functions that are homogeneous under a scaling symmetry and they're homogeneous with power two minus two h. So yeah, that's, that's, and of course I can immediately write these things down. That's kind of the point. It's just, it's trivially easy to write down such a form and then I can integrate it again over a two sphere quite easily and then I, I just land on solutions to nonlinear field equations in 4D. So simple thing in, in the higher dimensional gadget gives me explicit oh, solutions. Hmm? You're just polynomials. Um, these are polynomials, yes, but they can, um, the zero one forms uh, are, can be distributional. Okay, so anyway. Twister space, I don't know, maybe it looks like initially it's the kind of thing that only a mother can love. It's kind of complicated looking, but I just want to emphasize it's good for computing classical solutions to nonlinear masses field equations in 4D. It's also extremely good for making manifest the symmetries of a problem. And I'm not going to emphasize this part in the talk, but kind of one of the reasons we actually started playing with these systems is because uh, Kevin and I noticed that if you look at locally defined gauge transformations on twister space, um, uh, you reproduce precisely the symmetry algebras that people were studying um, in the context of celestial holography, things like W infinity algebras, these huge infinite dimensional Lie algebras that you can extract from the mode algebras of these 2D things. Uh, those are precisely gauge transformations of suitable theories of twister space, uh, locally defined. So I'm imagining gluing states together um, on overlaps of my twister space, kind of like I do for the holography. Um, so again, so twister space is extremely good for making symmetries manifest. That was kind of our initial observation. We just noticed, hey, the celestial symmetries algebra, uh, symmetry algebras are just gauge symmetries on twister space. So that's the right or one of the right ways to think about the symmetries of asymptotically flat space times. 
Um, and the details are in the paper, but I'm not going to emphasize that part of the story today. Um, and of course, as many other people know much better than me, twister space is extremely good for computing amplitudes, especially uh, integrands. Um, last little bit of notation, and then I promise I'll get on to the actual stuff. Um, as many of you know, twisters, in twister space, it's usually very convenient to introduce spinnerality variables. So if I have some null momentum, uh, p mu, I can use this uh, beloved isomorphism of, of uh, Lie groups to rewrite it as a two by two matrix on which there's an SL2C action on the left and the right. And because this is a null momentum, this matrix has zero determinant, which means I can write it as a row and a column vector um, that I call lambda and lambda tilde, which again, you can think of as the spinners of the appropriate uh, plus and minus chiralities in 40. Uh, the spin group splits into S plus and S minus if you like. Um, but this parameterization has a little bit of an ambiguity. If I scale lambda up by some number and I scale lambda tilde by one over the number, the parameterization is invariant. So I can use this affine symmetry to fix the overall normalization of things. And, and here's the only point of notation that's going to be important for the remainder. I'm going to write lambda as one comma z, where z is defined in terms of the momentum components in that way. And I do that because I want to emphasize right away that z is going to be my holomorphic coordinate on the celestial sphere, um, which might be natural because the celestial sphere is a space of null momenta. I shoot out a massless thing and can hit the space of the celestial sphere at asymptotic null infinity at some point, um, but I'll assign a holomorphic coordinate z. Um, and that's so twister space really is um, partly, you can think of it as the celestial sphere. It's not just the celestial sphere, it's bigger. But um, that's really part of the geometry. Um, that's the physical, one of the physical ways to think about the geometry of the space. And so you can see if I want to take kind of an OPE limit of two operators very close together on the sphere in four dimensions that's corresponding to a collinear limit um, in space time of, of these light rays. Okay, um, so all I want to remember, sorry. This is a, um, yeah. No. Um, good. So it was what I said. I think probably too fast before. These gauge transformations aren't locally well defined. Okay. Uh, or sorry, they're not locally well defined. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm gluing them together patchwise to get non-trivial states in three dimensions, but they're not locally well defined. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. How many dimensions? Six. So you say it's the celestial sphere, which is two dimensional. Yep. Plus the space of angular parameter. Yep. Yeah. Um, and I can talk about that more. Oh, this is six, though. Or are you saying that's tensor with four dimensional conditions? Yeah, this is this is a little bit sloppy. Um, it is six dimensional, uh, but this interpretation we can talk about after. Okay. Yeah. It might be a little bit more confusing than than enlightening um, at the moment. Okay. So that's the table setting. What am I actually going to talk about today? Again, the star of the story is going to be a local holomorphic theory on the six dimensional twister space, which again, roughly you want to think about as four dimensions times two dimensional sphere. Um, now, this holomorphic thing you might you know, say based on the introduction of my talk that these holomorphic theories kept showing up as world volume theories of D, brain, of D brains and super symmetric twist of things. So you may hope that everything I'm going to say has a string embedding, say to a physical string in 10 dimensions, or maybe some, just some twisted string in some higher number of dimensions. Um, and maybe it does, but I don't know. Um, so that's, that's a to be determined. Um, but the, this six dimensional theory at least is the setting in which we're going to be. And I'm going to get, again, kind of two-dimensional or four-dimensional physics, depending on uh, how I view or what I do with this six-dimensional theory. So firstly, on the one hand, I have this theory. And to get some four-dimensional physics, I'm going to do the obvious thing. I'm going to shrink the CP1. And since it's a holomorphic theory that doesn't care about the size components of the metric, it only cares about the space components of the metric, again, this is very special, um, I can basically do this essentially at no penalty. This is not like a normal kaluza klein reduction where I have to keep an infinite tower of modes. The holomorphic theory doesn't care about the size of the CP1, so I can just shrink it to zero and obtain also a local four-dimensional theory. Okay, so 
again, this is something that these are these are special theories. This is not something that I'm going to generically be able to do, but I can do it here. Um, and the result is that I have a conformal theory in four dimensions. Of course, twister space is naturally all about conformal physics, and the 4D theory um, inherits that too. Some non-unitary theory um, in general, I, it, it's going it's to be a little bit, uh, it's going to have some non-trivial or kind of tricky properties, but it is what it is. Um, I'll introduce it on the next slide. But roughly speaking, it's a self-dual Yang-Mills theory in four dimensions coupled to a particular real scalar field that I'm going to call the axion for reasons that will become clear. Um, although the fact that it's a conformal field theory isn't obvious necessarily from, from that description. On the other hand, I also say that I want to get a two-dimensional chiral algebra from the 6D physics. Um, and I'll explain how that goes shortly. Roughly speaking, the two-dimensional chiral algebra comes about from something I call kind of the universal holomorphic defect uh, on CP1. So I'll explain what that means. Um, but I want to just mention for, um, again, broad motivation that this way of uh, associating chiral algebras to various twisted theories um, is something that I've been working on, again, in this context of twisted ADS-CFT work with collaborators. Um, and I've also, it has a very well-developed uh, mathematical story that I've also written about recently um, in an exposition. I've written an exposition kind of on the math side for physicists that's also on the archive with Williams um, that I hope is, is useful. How do the dimensions work? So you have a defect on the P1, but there's still four dimensions in the Mr. space. So um, how do you get a chiral algebra out of that instead of something four dimensional? So the chiral, the chiral algebra is the, the two-dimensional thing supported on the CP1. Um, so that's, it's X, it, um, how, should, how should I say? So that's how you should think of it. Why the six-dimensional, why the kind of the rest of the four dimensions don't contribute in a way that this is actually an isomorphism is again something very, very special. Basically, um, I think I have this on the slide later, but basically, um, Basically, the six-dimensional fields don't contribute. And you're going to tell us some of the theories that's in the matrix twister space in a second or not? Yep. Okay. Is the crown also not unitary? Yes. Negative scaling dimensions. Negative integer scaling dimensions. And uh, no uniquely defined conformal blocks. There's a family of them. So again, when you think of this chiral algebra, I don't want you to think in my. I don't want you to think of the holomorphic half of a good 2D CFT. I want you to think of the boundary. Of some theory, much like WCW is the boundary of Trent Simon's theory. It's a 2D chiral algebra. Uh, that's really the analog you should have in mind. Um, and in fact, I, I can make, I'm going to make that more precise if I can later in the talk. I can exhibit this 2D theory as about the boundary algebra for a 3D theory as well. So it's not well, it's it's really just an algebraic structure. It's not well defined on its own. It's not even part of a well defined, it's not part of a well defined 2D CFT, and it has no stress tensor. Okay, so here are the theorems that we proved in the big paper. Um, they are at the level of mathematical theorems. So I promise that they're true. Um, I'm not going to prove them for you. Um, you're welcome. <laughs> but uh, what I'm going to try to do is give uh, like the heuristic kind of physics arguments for why they might be true. Um, and because I'm just going to sketch the arguments, the, you know, the arguments therefore are a little bit sketchy, but I think they're, they just give the right motivation for the results, even if we had to work much harder to get the details right. So I hope that'll be more useful than talking about vectors and geometries. Okay, so here's the main elements of the dictionary that we proved uh, for the special 4D theory and the special 2D chiral algebra. And again, I'm going to introduce both of those and the 6D theory momentarily. Um, but the conformal primary generators of this algebra are in one-to-one -one correspondence with single particle states in four dimensions. And moreover, they're single particle uh, states in a natural conformal primary basis. So this basis has also showed up recently. Um, it's been studied by, uh, uh, by Andy Strominger and friends. And rather than being in a momentum eigen basis, uh, it's convenient to re-diagonalize to a boost eigen basis by means of a Mellon transform. So you do an integral over all energy, but you land um, uh, with a particular um, eigenvalue under boosts instead. So these are natural. Mathematicians. Is that the time? But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, you say single particle, but it's a CFT, but it's not really a particle, or is it? Are we talking about a CFT, or are we I, I'm really talking about a CFT. So if you say single particle, what do
I mean, um, so you should think of, so if I started with, say, a, a gluon in a momentum, in a momentum eigen, uh, momentum eigenstate, Mellon transform it, so you have a continuum over energies, and um, I mean, more precisely, I'm really thinking of soft modes of, of gluons. Not, not well, they're going to be they're going to be gluons in the self dual yang mill sector, for example, and ultimately we're going to relate it to QCD, but no, not literally in QCD. My 40 theory is the CFT. Okay. So there's some conformal primary it, for the 40 CFT. There's some conformal primary states. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But they map to single particle um, soft modes of gluons in QCD. Okay. Yeah. You said the 2D theory doesn't have <coughs> stress tensor, so nope. it doesn't have the gross drop. So what's it still has an action of the sorrel algebra, but not the stress tensor, which is not totally obvious. Um, so geometrically, so if you if you work in 60, you can write a natural action, a geometric action of the Virasoral algebra by hallmarking vector fields. Mm -hmm. As a, as a geometer would define the Virasoral algebra, this thing does have an action. But if you like, you know, zero central charge, um, there's a cat's booty sector where the level is zero, so you can't build a super bar of stress tensor. It's an algebra. Yeah, so it's an algebra. Generated by an operator it's, it's not generated by a local operator in theory, the bare sort of um, so, um, so that's kind of first part of, of the dictionary. The second part is that um, local operators in the four-dimensional theory are in correspondence um, with conformal blocks. And okay, here I'm going to be a little bit more of a mathematician because the word conformal blocks is a little bit overloaded. Um, so I mean in the sense of, again, analogous to WZW and Chern Simons. I'll define what I mean uh, in physics language later. But here I really just mean a way to consistently define the correlation function that's consistent with the OPE and satisfies some basic axioms. And again, this is a non-unitary CFT. So the fact that there's a kind of a, a family of ways, there's not a unique inner product to define the correlation function, there's actually a host of choices, is again something that might be a little bit unfamiliar from garden variety 2D CFTs, where there's just a unique way to define the correlation functions. And here that's not true. They're actually in correspondence with local operators. Again, WZW model for those familiar is really the, the prototype. Um, and then once you kind of have these two parts of the dictionary, um, the main result is basically a formal consequence of that, um, because the generators are in correspondence with states, um, the formal blocks are, are in correspondence with local operators, and so form factors, which are, if you like, scattering amplitudes in the presence of a local operator, which we need to get something with a non-trivial scattering amplitude in the first place in CFT, um, can therefore be just mapped to a correlation function once you input the rest of this stuff. Okay, so again, I just want to stress our 40 theory, it's not QCD, but nonetheless, we're going to be able to extract certain uh, integrands, um, QCD integrands from this form factor. And at least in principle, combinatorially, if we work in our 40 theory at L loops with N insertions of a particular local operator, um, again, I'm just going to present you tree level results, but in principle, we should be able to produce the integrand for the scattering of N minus L plus one negative helicity gluons and arbitrary numbers of positive helicity gluons. So ostensibly that will be the map to the QCD amplitudes that I will be able to extract from this weird four dimensional conformal field theory. So far we've just been reproducing known expressions that uh, Lent and friends have written for us and, and Mark Taylor formula. But the machinery could go beyond that. That's all. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it would be ultimately the QCD amplitudes are going to be um, expressible in terms of a combination of things. They're going to be a sum of products of 2D chiral correlation functions times um, OPE coefficients in the 4D CFT, um, which I expect will, for any higher loop application, be the harder part because it's some complicated non unitary CFT. So um, that, that will, I think, be, be the difficult thing, but you know, perhaps you'll still get some non-trivial uh, constraints with 40 crossing symmetry that might maybe might make bootstrapping things at higher loops feasible potentially, but at least it's kind of a new expression mm -hmm. for these amplitudes. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope it'll be useful, but the real QCD or the self dual QCD. No, these are real QC. This is the class of real QCD amplitudes that I can extract from this funny 40 theory, which includes yeah. self-dual plus an axiom. 
But is it since it's faster to get it this way than the original way? So the Park Taylor example, which I'm going to do on the slide, is like one easy slide. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll present that. So tree level, super easy. Again, uh, at, at loop level, that would be nice, but I don't know. If you untwist tree really well, and you're calling it twisted, is there an untwisted statement which you can't make exact because then you can't run into other people and blah, blah, blah? Um, well, so that's, that's, that's what I do the full embed. Yeah. I mean, if I don't have a holomorphic theory, then suddenly I can't. Yeah, suddenly I have to probably pick up a modes here. Well, at the level of the 40, do we think, is there a straightforward theory to twist with none? Is the 40 self only? Actually, no, I don't. I, I don't know. It's, this is non super symmetric. And obviously, in the super symmetric analog, I mean, there's been twist restraint stories, but that's also been complicated. And, yeah, I, I actually, for the theory I'm going to tell you about, I, I don't quite know. <laughs> like, it smells like it should, but um, if someone else knows, I want to hide that. A related question is, should, I, should we think of this as being completely unrelated to AGT, or like, is it, it's it's, it's not 4D 2D in that sense, because I'm defining the 2D chiral algebra. As I said, it's kind of what I call this universal defect, so I'll tell you about it, but it's not literally, I'm reducing on 2D and I'm reducing on 4D. I've never reduced on 4D. So that's it. Um, and, and yeah, there the fact that the 4D fields kind of aren't contributing is really not trivial. Okay, so um, I suspect I'm not, okay, I'm behind on time, but I'll, let me try to get to at least the fun. Um, okay, so what theory am I studying? So I told you that my four dimensional theory is some combination of self dual angles plus some scalar sector that I need to tell you about. So the self dual part is actually quite easy. Um, and classically, it goes back to work by Penrose and Ward and others. And there, I have kind of a BF type action in four dimensions, and I'm including states of both helicities, which I think depending on who you ask, self dually angles uh, might or might not, but I'm including states of both helicities, and I just have this BF type action. So if I wanted to go uh, to recover ordinary angles, I would add a plus B squared term with a power of the angles coupling constant, and I would integrate out B. But I, I'm not going to do that. To this BF type term in four dimensions, I actually have a, another BF type action in six dimensions, which is known by the Penrose correspondence to reduce to the BF theory that I want in four dimensions. I'm using curly letters because now these are forms with holomorphic and anti-holomorphic components. But if I reduce on the CP1, this turns out to be what I get back. So it's a fairly straightforward uh, twister correspondence that classically has been known for a long time. Um, however, there's a problem. The problem is that while this classical correspondence is perfectly good, um, the six dimensional theory actually has a gauge anomaly. So if you want to study a 4D theory at the quantum level and kind of leverage twister space geometry um, upstairs, uh, you're not going to be able to do it um, in general for general gauge. Theory. Doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the 4D theory, but if the 6D theory is bad, it might not, it doesn't have a local lift at the quantum level necessarily, unless you cancel this gauge anomaly and repair the quantum consistency of the 6D theory. Um, but happily, we can actually do that. Um, my collaborator wrote a paper um, about that earlier this year as well. Um, and it turns out that there's a Green Schwartz like mechanism in six dimensions that enables you to cancel the gauge anomaly. <laughs> and we add this uh, scalar field. Uh, that, I, that I call the axion. So briefly, there's going to be a tree level diagram with this, uh, with the exchange of some, some field that cancels the one loop box diagram anomaly in, um, in the theory. And you can do this cancellation for some special choice of gauge groups. So SU2, SU3, SO8, the exceptionals. You can also cancel it uh, with SUNC with some choice of matter, but I'm just gonna not talk about that case today. I'm just gonna focus on the pure gauge case. Although I think this will, this will be interesting too. Um, so kind of what do we need to add in 60 to actually cancel uh, this anomaly and make the screen Schwartz mechanism work? The answer is basically a Kadira Spencer type theory of the sort that I told you about on the first slide. Something that depends on complex structure deformations, like a twist of a closed string theory, B model topological string theorists know and love this very much. And if you really want to think about this in a more physical way, it actually comes from a certain kind of twist of uh, this is uh, the usual anomaly cancellation mechanism for a 60 n equals one zero theory with a single tensor multiple. So this is how string theory kind of cancels that anomaly, and this is the twist of that. Um, but again, I'm going to be agnostic about string theories. 
Anyway, um, so you have some BCOV type theory that couples to the age sector, and there's a coefficient that's precisely tuned to cancel the anomaly as usual in these kinds of things. If you reduce it to four dimensions, what do you get? You get a real scalar field that I'm going to call the axion because it couples to the F wedge F term. The coefficient is precisely tuned um, in terms of the uh, data of the gauge, uh, gauge algebra that you choose. And it also has a funny quark. And did this come from integrating curly A over the sphere? The, yeah, this came from integrating out over the sphere. I mean, the row, did it come from integrating curly A over the sphere? It, it, it comes from uh, integrating out the, the closed string field, the BCOB field, which I called ADA here. Oh, so ADA, ADA. Oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah, F wedge yeah. F comes from ADA and the row comes Sorry, from ADA. So this is like a geometrically, it's a Beltrami differential for the complex structure down here. Um, yeah, so there's this funny kind of, so, so kind of the only novel thing about this thing is a coordinate kinetic term, but um, as was pointed out to me, um, this kind of action with coordinate kinetic terms has actually showed up in other places in four dimensions pretty much any time you want to cancel a conformal anomaly. Um, so it really seems that there's this kind of unique way to get CFTs in four dimensions, or at least we keep we hit on this action that Komargutsky Schwimmer and other people have already said in other contexts. So we didn't really expect that, but that's kind of nice. So, Adam, were you applying your signature theory of just like R4 times, times the CP1? Well, why are we using this twister space? Um, so, you, yeah, R, in R4 cross CP1, the, the, the the non-trivial kind of geometry of twister space is important for various reasons. I have to choose for the particular behavior of the fields um, at certain sub loci in twister space to get the right solutions to the field equations in 4D. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not really as simple as R4 cross CP1. The Penrose transform won't work if I try to engineer something like that. Well, we could have studied this behavior Um, you could take the CP1 to be small, but no, you wouldn't, you wouldn't land precisely. Yeah, I haven't really thought about it, but you certainly wouldn't get the usual thing. Yeah. I don't quite know what you mean. Yeah, but the, the non-trivial vibration structure is important. Um, but when I think of, when I think of Twitter's face as just, it's a, one that is fiber it's fiber yeah. yeah for obtaining solutions to this 40 to, to for obtaining precisely this four dimensional theory or maybe i'm not understanding that question it's Yeah, yeah, this this isn't true if I just replace PT with R4 across CP1. Um, I, I won't, I wouldn't um, get, for example, solutions to the anti self equations. Yeah, so it's and then presents the effect of the space. Yep, this is a way to, this is another way to cancel the twister space anomaly. So and for this theory, I can upload. Really supersymmetric or? No, I think the supersymmetric theory is something, it's something else. Um, you can certainly cancel the anomaly with supersymmetry, but we didn't want to. Uh, these are two non supersymmetric ways to cancel the anomaly. Okay, then it presents to Um, uh, yeah, well, this is this is fundamental matter. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it's a secretly n equals one. You're saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that may be uh, certainly with n equals four. I think we know that. Yeah. But sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe this is secret. Oh, y'all need to think about that. I haven't really played with this example in detail, but that may be. Okay. Hmm. I don't want to say how many slides I'm on out of like the total number of slides, but um, to orient you, let me just tell you what the 2D chiral algebra is, and then I'll put, put the pieces together. Um, so just here's the 2D chiral algebra. It's some big algebra. 
The details aren't important. I have a bunch of generators and they're each indexed by um, positive integers. So there's a whole infinite family for each of, of these towers of generators. Um, physically, you should think of J and J tilde as corresponding to soft modes of positive and negative helicity gluons, whereas these other towers come from the axion field, essentially. So I have particular spins under, um, under S, the SL2 transformation that acts on the celestial sphere or on the CP1 of twister space equivalently. Um, and they also transform under some SU2, which acts more like a flavor symmetry. So there's some well-defined uh, uh, data for how they transform there. Um, and here's the tree level OPEs. And I can tell you how I got them later. I just want to emphasize on this slide that we have a prescription for obtaining this thing from any local polymorphic theory on twister space that isn't gauge anomalous. Um, although right now these OPEs are just tree level, I'll kind of deform them later. Um, and it's an enlargement of the chiral algebra that appeared in the celestial liter uh, literature that was studied by this group, uh, enlarged in particular by the axion. Um, how do you get it from the 6B holomorphic theory? Well, um, it's relatively straightforward, so let me sketch it briefly, uh, since my time management is atrocious. Um, so I have, it's very easy for, so here, here's kind of the recipe. It's easy for me to build conformal primaries on twister space that have negative weight. Twister space, again, it's all about massless and conformal things. So this is something I can readily build with just some basic geometric tools, and I can get those states right away. You can just kind of trust me on that. And they correspond to on-shell gauge theory states in analytically continued space or axiom states. Um, and by Penrose transform, if I integrate those things over the CP1, I land on a standard basis of primary states in uh, negative, in four dimensions that again have a negative conformal weight. And this kind of conformal basis, again, has been studied by celestial holography folks in any case. On the other hand, to get to generators of a 2D chiral algebra, what I really want to do um, is obtain states in kind of in the vacuum module of this chiral algebra or obtain the generators that I presented on the previous slide by studying on-shell background fields in 6D that are localized at some point on the CP1. So these generators couple in this way to the gauge fields of six dimensions. This is like a general, this is just a simple generalization of an AJ type coupling. Where I'm allowing holomorphic derivatives also in the fiber directions. And so however many holomorphic derivatives in the two fiber directions I allow, of course, oh, sorry, this should be k1 and k2, or these are the same integers, I apologize, that, that course, uh, corresponds to the indices on the generators. So for example, if I want to plug in some, some uh, background gauge field, this is an on-shell conformal primary state in six dimensions, I can write down a simple polynomial in the fiber coordinates like this, and had, have some um, form value distribution that localizes it at a point on CP1. So it's at a point at CP1, it's some polynomial in the fibers. Um, and this state in six dimensions will precisely source the corresponding current that I want on my two dimensional uh, defect. Um, and uh, if you want to talk about fancy math, there's also a fancy math understanding of this that I've developed with some folks. Um, but basically, when I say universal chiral algebra, I just mean that any other, any kind of holomorphic two-dimensional theory that you could possibly in your life want to couple to a six-dimensional theory um, has to have a map to this chiral algebra. This is the most general algebra consistent with gauge invariants. That's really all it is. These are the most general gauge invariant couplings that you can write down. Um, and, and so any other kind of defect that you want to try to couple to your 6D theory has to form a representation of this chiral algebra, um, is one that I said. Uh, but yeah, th this is kind of this is the physics behind it. So and we can a, also. The A is in the 60 state. Right? It's in 60, yeah. And the J is just for the. It's, it's on, yeah, it's in 2D. So these couplings are integrated just over CP. So it's a 2D chiral algebra. And it's talking to the 60 theory. I haven't understood yet how. Uh, I'm, yeah, so I can obtain the state J in two dimensions, um, like the state is just what arises by studying an on-shell background field in six dimensions that's localized at a point. 
like a, such such a gauge configuration um, produces. Was that the point in six dimensions? Or? Localized at a point on uh, CP1. And what about the other facility? And it's some polynomial in the other. These are two complex coordinates in the other form. So, some. Like the extrapolate dictionary that gives an absolute person. So, in, let's say in your intercept form, maybe in your WZW analogy. Um, yeah, so I, the WZW analogy, yeah, I, I, in a couple slides, I will talk about it. But I, I think it's most. It, I guess it is roughly, you can think about it like an extrapolate dictionary, but it's just such a simple theory that there's kind of the extrapolation is sort of trivial. Okay, like okay. it's like you can go right to the CP1, but like, okay. sure, it's the kind of, yeah, in twisted holomorphic land, it's like any of the, <laughs> anything that depends on distance is like sufficiently trivial that you're just kind of right there. Um, but anyway, these generators, like I said, they kind of correspond to soft modes, um, and it's often convenient to kind of re-sum them um, with appropriate powers of energy to get back to momentum, to a momentum eigenbasis or, or hard blue ones. Um, that's particularly useful when you want to get back to amplitude. So um, anyway, there's a precise way to do that. Um, okay. I'm running out of time, so I want to. What I want to do is really get to a punchline here, and then I'm happy to go back and talk details with anyone that wants to stay. But I don't want to torture people um, that have other things to do. Just quickly, in your loose statement before, when you were talking about thinking the twister sphere as as the sort of celestial sphere, yeah, the twister space is the celestial sphere with angular momentum, which I think of R and S on your previous slides, angular momentum, and so Z is the point on the twister sphere where you're doing stuff, and oh, I'm sorry, yeah, celestial sphere. Totally. Uh, the, yeah, yeah, Z is the point on the celestial sphere and, and at which you're doing Yeah, so, well, roughly, I mean, they contribute to all of, I mean, they contribute to all of this, the spin and conformal dimension of the operators. Um, and they also correspond to a certain scaling symmetry in four dimensions, but there's some negative scalings. But yeah, basically. Okay. Um, so I showed you the tree level OPEs. I will be brief about this slide and I'm happy to talk in details with anyone that's interested. Um, I mentioned that OPEs on the celestial sphere are related to collinear limits in four dimensions. And there are known uh, collinear splitting functions in the literature that correspond to um, what would be appropriate quantum deformations of this chiral algebra, or one loop corrections, if you like, to the OPE. Um, it turns out kind of the punchline for this slide, which is also kind of the main result of the short talk, is if you just kind of input the known collinear, the collinear splitting functions from QCD, the ones that are relevant for the self dual yang mill sector in particular, um, and you just study that chiral algebra, it fails to be associated. Uh, or equivalently, you would have to turn off all of the negative helicity states to get something well behaved. So it just doesn't satisfy the axioms of a quantum of, of, a, of a chiral algebra if you if you go beyond if you uh, study the one loop splitting amplitudes if you go over beyond tree. On the other hand, the theory with the axion is totally associative. We can compute um, in various different ways these corrections, including with uh, fancy math stuff, but also not with fancy math stuff. And the coefficients are actually completely fixed by this Green Schwartz anomaly coefficient in 60, and we have a good chiral algebra. So, do we have negative pulsary states in the self dual Depends on if you want them or not. So, Andy and friends pointed out that if you just take self dual yang mills as positive felicity states only, then you do have an associative thing. Um, I want negative felicity states, uh, but you, you need the axiom. Do you want full QCD interactions at this stage? Or? At this stage, I'm just interested in my 4D theory, um, which is self dual yang mills plus the so axiom with negative felicity. Plus, for the plus the anti self dual. Um, So my for me, my definition of self delaying angles is BF type action, but including states of both publicities. But I also think plus coupled to the axiom. Yeah. Uh, that's for me my definition. So you have an F squared term in the axiom? Uh, well, I have the F wedge F term coupled to the axiom, but otherwise, no, I only have the BF term. Uh, the, B, the B term is going to be the source of the negative velocity, or the B field. Um, 
Okay, very briefly here, because maybe I just want to get to a short computation so you can actually like see the output of some of this machinery. As I mentioned, 40 operators, local operators are also isomorphic to 2D conformal blocks. Um, again, happy to talk details for anyone that wants to stick around. But basically, um, if I take twister space and I excise the CP1 corresponding to the origin, like a point where I would want to insert a local operator at the origin, then the manifold looks like this. And I have two compact spaces on which I could dimensionally reduce one of two ways. If I dimensionally reduce on a CP1 up here, I get R4 with the origin removed. If I dimensionally reduce on the S3, I get a CP1 cross R greater than zero. And if I do this dimensional reduction properly and really include all the KK modes, I end up with a three-dimensional theory, which we described precisely in the big paper, for which the 2D chiral algebra is the boundary algebra. And it's a twist of a 3DN equals 2 theory. So we can describe it very precisely. It's a certain turn sign matter theory at level zero. Um, and the space of conformal blocks, then, in this definition, is really the Hilbert space uh, quantized in the radial quantization on that CP1 of the 3D theory. That's one way to define the space. Or equivalently, we can show that it's isomorphic to uh, the Hilbert space of the 40 theory on S3. Uh, again, the 40 theory is a conformal field theory, so we're doing some radial quantization. And that's the space of local operators. And that is where the isomorphism morally comes from. Again, I'm being a, a, a little bit quick, so I'm skipping details, but that's just the basic idea. Um, what is the free theory? I mean, I can throw examples of this, or is there a simple action? I mean, we wrote the action in the paper. I just. It's not something that Well, I mean, how simple is a twist of a 3D n equals 2? It's like it's turn time into matter theory coupled to scatter right matter. Oh, and this is one where you know the untwisted theory. That's the standard n equals 2. Yeah, I know the. I, I do know the untwisted theory downstairs okay. in 3D. Uh, one of the things I'm playing with now is like with the meaning of monopole. Because I, I understand the, the 3D theory extremely well, 3D n equals 2 theories. I also understand the boundaries of 3D n equals 2 theory very well from like other work I've done with Dayato and Demofte. And, but mapping that up here and down there is something I'm still trying to figure out. Um, I'm going to skip this slide, uh, but it's more, it's heuristic motivation for uh, the formal theorem that we proved, but maybe in the interest of time, you can uh, trust me that it works. Uh, but let me just show you the computation. Um, so if I want to com compute a certain correlation function where I have two of my J tildes and an arbitrary number of Js, I want to show that I can reproduce the color order and I'll choose, I have to choose a conformal block because I have a non-unitary chiral algebra that corresponds to a local operator in 4D. So in this notation, the local operator in 4D is trace B squared, the operator that I would insert if I wanted to perform my action to be ordinary QCD. Um, and I'm, this is implicit, this is the conformal block associated with that local operator. But this is a purely 2D thing. Okay, so how do I do it? Well, I'm going to use a simple induction. Um, first, I just need to figure out this basic conformal block where I have um, the corresponding to this choice of local operator with two J tildes. This is the first not vanishing such uh, correlation function that I could write down in my 2D theory for basic uh, uh, quantum number reasons, charge conservation reasons. Um, and there's various ways to compute this thing. In the paper, we computed it directly from 60. And it also turns out to be very simply and uniquely fixed by the symmetries of the problem, basically by Lorentz invariants. Um, so this simple correlation function you can basically write down by symmetry. Then you can ask, what if I insert a single pot, uh, a single J, which would correspond to a positive gluon? Could you explain again what the notation of what is this trace B squared? In principle, this is a a like that. I don't want there. Is that a point function of A in the 16 theory? This is a two dimensional correlation function. In the, this is a 2D chiral algebra correlation function. But this is a non unitary chiral algebra. So there's not a unique way to define correlation functions. There's a family of conformal blocks, um, meaning there's a, a whole host of ways to actually define correlation functions. And, that, and so there's a choice here that you have to make when you compute 2D correlation functions. And I'm labeling that two-dimensional choice by the local operator in 4D that it corresponds to. And that local operator in 4D is trace B squared. You mentioned direct computation in 60. Does that yes. mean that one has a meaning in 60? That one has the item one there has a meaning. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Um, the meaning is if we kind of go back to the couplings I wrote 
the 60 generator couplings on the previous slide, um, yeah. you, can, you can write us the kind of path that can roll. Um, expression that computes this for you. Uh, Insert the two J tildes with that term in the action, yeah. with that source term in the action in 60. And what is the tracing square for that? So that's just, okay. So that means you define the control over the V, the V X theory with some, some background A view. It's the four plus the J theory. In the four dimensional theory, I'm computing a scattering amplitude in the presence of a local operator B squared insertion. That's pretty confusing, I guess. Yeah. You could just simply do Yeah, sorry. So, I, because I skipped this slide, it's maybe more confusing. Um, there's a key point here, which is non obvious, and I think maybe is causing your confusion. Um, and I didn't really have the time to explain it. But the important thing here is that I can imagine computing. Something in a 60 theory coupled to a two dimensional holomorphic defect. Um, and if I dimensionally reduce that thing to four dimensions, I would have a 40 theory in the presence of a local operator. So this thing would be the form factor in 4D. If I lifted it to 60, ostensibly it looks like there's no way that I could get a purely 2D thing from the 60 to, with my, to my, in my 60 theory coupled to these J's, with these JA, J tilde B type source terms. However, the key point is that actually the exchange of 60 fields will never actually contribute to the amplitude. The 4D form factor computation is actually completely mediated by the defect uh, fields only. And that's very non obvious and it's very special to this local theory in six dimensions. Um, uh, basically, you can always choose a gauge where the six dimensional fields will never propagate on the celestial sphere, they'll only propagate in the fiber directions. And so, actually, what naively looks like something you have to do in a full 60 theory reduces to a two dimensional computation, but that's really not obvious. Um, and we have, we proved it mathematically as well. This is just kind of some sketch, but no, it's, it's, it's far, it's far from obvious. Um, but, but nonetheless, there, there, it's really a theorem that 2D correlation, that genuine 2D correlation functions are in one-to-one -one correspondence with 4D form. Um, okay, so just very quickly, just to, to show the answer, this thing I can compute if I like 60 or fix my symmetry. If I add a single copy of J, then what can I do? I can use the OPE, I have two different natural OPE limits I can take to reduce it to a sum of two terms where I basically have reduced the computation to two point, the two point function that I computed in step one. Um, and Z23 is the usual diff the distance between the two things on the celestial sphere, which in spinner helicity notation are going to be my angle brackets 2, 3, or 1, 3. Um, and then I use identity 1 to simplify this expression. And then I can basically do elementary induction now on n insertions of positive helicity gluons, run the same argument, and then I immediately get the color order. Um, I can also compute uh, the CSW formula for tree level NMHB amplitudes in a similar way, um, but I need a different kind of conformal block, um, and I'm already way over time, so I want to spare you the details. Um, I, let me just um, mention that to get the QCD amplitudes in particular, I'm always in choosing trace B squared as my local operator insertion, and I can insert many copies of it. Um, but in general, the QCD amplitudes themselves will depend on the OPE coefficients of 40 times the 2D correlation functions. And that's not to be confused with the 40 form factors. 40 form factors in my weird theory are, to, are equivalent to 2D correlation functions. But if I really want to take this stuff and produce QCD amplitudes of the type that I mentioned a few slides ago, with certain numbers of negative helicity gluons and arbitrary numbers of positive helicity gluons, I'll have 40 and 2D contributions. Yeah. Operator changes momentum conservation, right? Yes. So when you say you get a QCD amplitude, it's not really, I mean, it's not, it doesn't satisfy the sum of the momentum zero. Yeah, I don't have the moment. Yeah, so I haven't integrated over positions, and I actually don't have the momentum conserving delta function, and that would be an important point for pushing this forward. Absolutely. Is there some background source in the QCD interpretation? Or? Um, in QCD, no. These are just scattering amplitudes. 
influence many of the absence of religious conservation is that explained oh. to you by a kind of like inclusivity or, or no? I, I'm on I'm not really I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure. Um, a while ago we were going to have some operators which are like uh, f squared where f is itself a little part of the field structure. Yeah. And then uh, some two negative velocities also are uh, no, it comes kind of the same from the formula as the part two. Yeah. Yeah. So Lance sent me a paper yeah. yesterday that might answer this question. Uh -huh. Yeah. And it doesn't really the formula doesn't really depend on the momentum of the operator. And maybe so, you just put it in the position space. Presumably have any more difference. So so that may answer the question, but yeah, I need to read the paper. Um okay. So Sorry that I had to rush uh, fast through some of the details and be a little bit quick about things. Um, final thoughts and future directions, and I'm happy to go back and take questions and all of that. Um, we want to study integrands at higher loops. And again, I would be really interested to know if we can do some kind of 4D and 2D kind of joint bootstrap to use that to get uh, integrands at higher loop levels. Useful way. Um, I think, of course, the main bottleneck is going to be those four dimensional OPEs that I called Fs on the previous slide. But maybe, you know, maybe from associativity, there might still be useful constraints on them. Uh, I don't know. I'd like to know. Uh, the 2D chiral algebra is in very good control. As I mentioned, we've actually characterized the quantum directions of it as well using the anomaly uh, and the axiom really helps us there. But the 4D piece, you know, that's hard. Um, I would like to know if maybe. Even more transcendental amplitudes could possibly be accessed, maybe in some expansion from this formalism, maybe with higher point axion exchange. But again, I don't know. That's kind of a wild hope. Um, I don't understand the string embedding yet. I don't understand magnetic things quite yet. Uh, gravity, we uh, there are some things I understand and some things I don't understand. But there's a self gravity version of this whole story that pretty much goes through. Um, uh, we have. Another kind of um, fun example that we're playing with that has holographic connections, if you want to hear about that. Um, and, and there's, obviously, I have more questions than I have answers, but I hope that um, this is some inter uh, I hope that this was some roughly comprehensible introduction to what we did. And um, yeah, and that's where I'll end. Sorry for going over. Further questions, Yeah.